Thanks very much, Gary. It's a real privilege to be at this conference and uh, with my distinguished co-presenters. Uh, I've given a deliberately provocative title because I don't think there's any value in understating the scale of the problem. Uh, I think if you were asked the question, can civilization survive, you'd say if you were a gambler you wouldn't put stolen money on our chances because we don't yet show any sign of collectively perceiving the scale of the problem, let alone having the political will or the social institutions to deal with it. But um, I'm a congenital optimist, um, and I finish up at more or less the same place as Robert did, uh, coming from a, a different direction of being uh, an unreconstructed scientist rather than a reconstructed economist. So if I can make this work. Yep. Uh, this is arguably the bottom line. Uh, only visible earlier this week when the Living Planet Report 2014 came out, the most recent ecological footprint of humanity. Uh, back at the left-hand side, 1961, I was an undergraduate student at this institution. The John Nyland Sienta building did not exist. In fact, where I'm standing now was part of Randwick Golf Course, and John Nyland was a Year 12 student, about to become a very ambitious young commerce student at this institution. And our footprint was about three quarters of the sustainable productivity of natural systems. Today it's about 150% of the sustainable productivity of natural systems. And in this age of fiscal rectitude, where it's almost a hanging offence for a treasurer to produce a deficit budget because of the perception that this puts financial pressure on future generations, it's appalling that we're as sanguine as we are about the ecological deficit, which much more surely puts burdens on future generations. I spent a year running a little organisation called the Commission for the Future in the days when we thought about the future in Australia rather than knowing that it would certainly be delivered in an optimum fashion by world markets. And its premise was that the future is not somewhere we're going but something we're creating. Now, as at any time in the past, there are a whole range of possible futures, and which one occurs will be the product of decisions and actions. It seems to me axiomatic that we should be trying to create a sustainable future, that is, one that is able to be sustained, if not forever, at least for the foreseeable future. Now, that might seem a radical proposition given the behaviour of recent governments, but I'd remind you that more than 20 years ago, COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, in a, a rash of uh, uh, optimism and uh, principle, actually adopted a national strategy for ecologically sustainable development. So at least in principle, the Commonwealth and all state and territory governments are committed to a path of economic progress that does not impair the welfare of future generations, equity within and between generations, recognition of the global dimensions, and a focus on protection of biological diversity and the maintenance of ecological properties and systems. It clearly slipped past the attention of our Prime Minister when preparing his proposals for next month's G20 meeting, uh, but that is, at least in principle, uh, our government's approach. Of course, as we've known for some time, and as UNEP said in their second report on global environmental outlook 15 years ago, our present course is unsustainable, postponing action is no longer an option, although it was the universal political response to that UNEP report. Uh, Brian kindly had Australia below the ecological capacity line on his graph, but uh, as uh, Gary mentioned in introducing me, uh, 20 years ago I was helping to prepare our first independent national report on the state of the environment. And in it we said Australia has some very serious environmental problems. If we want to achieve the goal of ecological sustainability we need to address them. The problems are the cumulative consequences of population growth and distribution, lifestyles, technologies and demands on natural resources. There have been three further reports in the series, the most recent in 2011, and the update is much of our heritage is in good condition, other parts are in poor condition or deteriorating, our changing climate and growing population and economy are now presenting us with new challenges. I mean, there's nothing new about the environmental science. We've known it for 40 years. Um, the first state of the environment report said population growth and increase in consumption are part of the problem. Three subsequent reports have documented that they're all getting worse. 
because, as we gave in particular detail for Sydney between 1970 and 1990, in that period the population increased by 30 per cent and consumption per person increased by 30 per cent. 1.3 times 1.3 is 1.69, so there was about a 70 per cent increase in Sydney's footprint in that 20-year period. And, uh, the footprint has got larger since, partly because there are more feet and partly because they're wearing bigger gumboots. Um, every major problem is worsening and when I was president of the Australian Conservation Foundation we made a serious uh, proposal to the Commonwealth Government in their round of submissions under the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, arguing that growth in the human population is a major threatening factor affecting the decline of uh, listed ecosystems like coastal wetlands and heathlands and grasslands. The equation is clear, impact equals population times affluence times technology, so the impact is equal to population unless either affluence declines or technology improves faster than population increases. Let me just remind you of the numbers. The, if I can. The natural increase in Australia is about 150,000 per year, the difference between births and deaths. Uh, the birth rate is now down to about the replacement rate, but the number of adult women is still increasing as a result of the past birth rate and past migration. And this is complemented by a net migration of about a quarter of a million a year on average. So the population would be growing about a million every seven years with no migration. It's now growing by a, about a million every three years. The ABS does a series of projections, uh, series A, B and C, with different assumptions about birth rate and migration. Uh, I don't want to depress you, but the current population is above the series A projection done in 1990, and the current series A projection has a population at the end of this century above 60 million and increasing rapidly, and their most optimistic scenario doesn't have it stabilising till about 35 million. In fact, the population would stabilise in the 2030s somewhere below 30 million if we had zero net migration from today. It stabilises later and at a higher level with net migration between zero and 70,000. But on current settings, the 2100 population will be over 60 million and still growing rapidly. So if we're going to get our ecological footprint down to what would be sustainable use of Australia's natural systems, that means consumption per person would have to be about 20 per cent of what it is today. And I don't need to remind you that most of the politicians who are accelerating our population are not in favour of reducing consumption per person to 20 per cent of what it is today. I think the solution is obvious. For a sustainable future, we have to stabilise both our population and consumption and uh, indeed reduce per capita consumption. Increasing population compounds the task of reducing our impact to what might be sustainable. So this is again the graph of the world ecological footprint, now 150 per cent of what is sustainable and to use the words of our poet Mark O'Connor, there's no chance of reducing the ecological footprint if we keep adding more feet. Uh, some people take comfort in the fact that the population increase was over 80 million 30 years ago and it's now only about 72 million a year, but that's still a very significant increase and a very significant demand on extra resources. It is still alarming. So what are the global impacts? Well, the fifth report in the UNEP series on global environmental outlook said the current observed changes to Earth systems are unprecedented in human history and warned that several critical thresholds at local, regional or global level are close to or have not been exceeded. And uh, Robert Costanza drew your attention to the fact that we're outside the safe boundaries in three critical areas, climate change, biodiversity and the nitrogen cycle. The Millennium Assessment gave half a dozen examples of nonlinear change. Perhaps the best known is the Newfoundland cod fishery, which was harvested more or less sustainably at about a quarter of a million tonnes a year for 100 years, until better technology made it possible briefly to catch about three times as many fish. The fishery collapsed, there was a minor revival, and it then collapsed completely. So the New Newfoundland cod fishery effectively no longer exists. In terms of species diversity more generally, I think this is the really chilling graphic from the Millennium Assessment. The left-hand side gives extinctions per thousand species per millennium, perhaps. 
and there's a certain amount of by guess and by Gaia about some of these estimates. That's a logarithmic scale, so for marine species there's a factor of 10 between the best and worst estimate over the long-term history. But the critical point is that the recent past, the rate of extinctions is between 100 and 1,000 times the long-term average over the planet's history. So we are already in the middle of the sixth major extinction event in Earth history. Uh, and uh, if uh, you think about why we are losing species, there are three basic driving forces, loss of habitat, introduced species and chemical pollution. None of those forces is being reduced, but they're now being complemented by climate change. And the right-hand side gave the chilling estimate of what might happen this century on present trends, a rate of extinction somewhere between 10 and 100 times the present rate, which is already between 100 and 1,000 times the long-term history. Uh, if that were to happen, the Millennium Assessment warned, we would lose about a third of all mammal, bird and amphibian species this century. So we're not talking about a minor problem, we're talking about a catastrophic loss of the biological diversity of the Earth. And in terms of a recent update, the Living Planet Report, some of you will have seen this, looked at 10,000 species, mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles and fish, basically the vertebrates, and what's happened since 1970. And across those 10,000 populations, uh, 10,000 species, there has been more than a 50% reduction in population in the last 40 years. So if we want to achieve that sixth extinction episode, we're right on track, fellas. Just uh, keep the policy settings where you are. In launching the report, the Director General of WWF International said, and that's a direct quote, heads of state need to start thinking globally. Businesses and consumers need to stop behaving as if we were living in a limitless world. In a sense, this is one direct and concrete piece of evidence of the warning we were given by limits to growth 40 years ago. Uh, Graham Turner will be speaking later at this conference, um, but he's done the analysis first comparing limits to growth with 30 years of data and now 40 years of data, and basically we are still right on track with the Club of Rome standard run, which leads to economic and ecological collapse before 2050. Um, of course, no one has to change. Survival is optional, but uh, I think survival is a good option. Um, if you want more detail about uh, the mess we're in and uh, how the forces of darkness have colluded to blind us to this reality, I urge you to read Karen Higgs' new book, Collision Course, which I'm now reading. It's a wonderful treatise on the topic. Just to remind you that it's not just scientists, but there are actually some economists who perceive this, the World Economic Forum held a summit on the global agenda in Dubai in 2008, and their final statement said, and I quote, these recent crises, fuel, food and finance, are simply the three canaries in the, the mine. The early warning signals that the current economic system is simply not sustainable, a recognition that the entire economic system is predicated on the fiction that you can have limitless growth in a closed system. I'll just say a few words about climate change, given that uh, we still have prominent denials in the Australian political system. Yeah. It is getting warmer, <laughs> perhaps not as much as this suggests, but uh, uh, we need to recognise that the Holocene has been a period of unprecedented climate stability over the last 10,000 years, uh, and that has allowed the dramatic expansion of the human population and the development of human civilization. Of course, there have been changes of climate during that period, as the deniers constantly remind us. But those changes of climate have had significant ecological and social impact, despite their relative small magnitude compared with what we're facing. For example, in the medieval warm period, the Vikings were in Greenland, and it was a Greenland, not a frozen waste. And in the Little Ice Age, the Viking community on Greenland collapsed because of the changing conditions that meant they were no longer able to grow crops and grow food. Interestingly, the Viking community on Iceland survived because they adapted and moved to using fish as their source of protein rather than trying to grow crops and feed animals. But if you look at this scale on the left, the, those two excursions, the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age, were less than half a degree different from the average over the last 10,000 years. We are now 0.8 degrees than the average over the last 10,000 years and heading north at a rate of knots. And of course, I'm sure you all know the figures. 
The 1980s was the warmest decade ever. The 1990s were still warmer, with every year warmer than the 1980s average. The 2000s were still warmer, with every year warmer than the 1990s average, and so on. Um, and there are non-linear effects occurring. For example, this graph shows the total annual inflow to Perth's water supply system. And the critical point is that in no year since 1975 has the inflow reached what was the average for the first 75 years of last century. Uh, the average inflow now is a third of what it was before 1975. And that's why even a body as conservative as the International Energy Agency said in their World Energy Outlook six years ago, the world now needs nothing less than an energy revolution. Of course, they didn't have the advice from wise experts like Morris Newman and Dick Warburton uh, <laughs> leading them to this erroneous conclusion. And of course, if you know that government shouldn't interfere in the market, which can safely be trusted to maximise human welfare, if the science says that we should, then clearly the scientists are lying. And if all the scientists are saying it, they're clearly colluding in a conspiracy to undermine the sanctity of the market. The chair of the IPCC, Richenda Pachori, said we don't just need better technology, clean generation and efficient conversion, but we also need a new ethic by which every human being realises the importance of the challenge and starts to take action through changes in lifestyle. And that's the critical point. I agree with Robert that it's not enough just to warn people about the perilous path we're on. We also need to be spelling out the prospects of a better and more civilised approach. I've developed an acronym because we use acronyms for important ideas, like our foreign policy approach, Australians suspect every Asian neighbour, we remember by the acronym ASEAN, and uh, we have acronyms to summarise the attributes of our recent Prime Ministers. For example, Mr Howard's approach to reconciliation, hold off when apology really demanded, we remember by the acronym Howard. Uh, and you might unkindly say really unpleasant diplomatic dithering was uh, uh, an acronym for Mr Rudd, and always believe bullshit over truthful talk is an acronym for Abbott. So, uh, That's unkind. It's accurate, but it's unkind <laughs> to a man who is a former Rhodes Scholar and to give credit where credit is due, one of the finest minds of the 15th century. But uh, <laughs> in that spirit, I suggest we should be encouraging people to think about what I've called healthier futures, futures which are humane, have an ecocentric approach, a long time horizon, are informed, efficient and resourced. They're humane because we develop approaches and technologies that can at least in principle be extended to the whole human family rather than a privileged minority in a minority of countries. It has an ecocentric approach because we recognise the need to live within the boundaries of natural systems, which after all we will be forced to do because nature always bats last. If we don't voluntarily move to live within the boundaries of natural systems, we will be forced to do it by responses that will not be pleasant. We need a long time horizon because our decisions about urban planning, about population, about energy supply and use, about transport have consequences decades or centuries into the future. And if we were stupid enough to embrace nuclear power, that would have consequences hundreds of thousands of years into the future. But these decisions are routinely taken by people whose focus is on this year's balance sheet or next year's election. And we urgently need to develop a much more systematic approach to looking at the long-term consequences of our decisions. We need to be informed because we're still cosmically ignorant of complex natural systems. Much of the damage we've done to the environment has been done through ignorance rather than malice, and we're still almost certainly doing unnecessary damage through ignorance. It needs to be efficient because we could certainly satisfy human needs using a quarter of the resources we now use or less, and those resources need to come from natural systems. In my book, A Big Fix, which I won't promote from this podium because that would be unprincipled, I've suggested that the, the Japanese Shinto shrine of Ise is a nice metaphor for how we should live, taking resources from natural systems at a rate which can be replenished. Uh, just to end, I can see even in a friendly gathering like this a few people thinking this is a bit utopian, but I've told many of you before, 200 years ago it was utopian to be arguing for the end of slavery. A hundred years ago, it was utopian to be arguing in most parts of the world, not Australia, that women should have the vote. 
And only 25 years ago, it was still utopian to be dreaming of Berlin without the wall, or South Africa without apartheid, or Americans electing an African-American as their president, or such basic things as good coffee and civilised licensing laws in Queensland. <laughs> in fact, if you think about it, practically all features of modern life were once utopian visions, and we have them because people in previous epochs did not assume that the world they lived in was as good as it got, and worked systematically and purposefully for a better world. And just as those who recognised the immorality of slavery or the immorality of denying the majority of the adult population the vote worked systematically to change it, those of us who now recognise the immorality of living as if future generations and other species don't matter have a moral duty to, as Pete Seeger put it, turn the ship around. We need, as the national strategy agreed, to make social and economic decisions that maintain the integrity of natural systems. We need businesses and consumers to stop behaving as if we were living in a limitless world because we all occupy a small and limited planet. Thank you very much. Thank you.